You are a bold speaker. You are radically called and anointed by God that your voice will touch nations, move generations, cast down devils, overthrow the demonic realm, and see the kingdom of God advance. You know, that's the kind of voice God delights to put inside of you. It's a trumpet blast of your confession, a trumpet blast of the speech that comes out of you, a trumpet blast when you speak the name of Jesus. How many trumpets do I have in the house tonight? Ezekiel chapter 33, I want you to understand the purpose of the body of Christ. The purpose of your life as a believer is to have a voice and a sound in your voice which is dynamic, which is, which is tremendous in the things of God and is dictated by the word of God. Your voice is a radical weapon in the kingdom. The prophetic heart of God down inside your spirit that brings forth the word that God has, the word of breakthrough, the word of healing, the word of God, salvation, his redemption, his deliverance, everything about heaven, God wants to put down inside your spirit. So what goes in has got to come forth. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ezekiel chapter 33, I want to start this off as the church has to have a radical voice, a trumpet sound. And he says, again, the word of the Lord came to me, verse chapter 33, 1. Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, when I bring a sword or calamity upon a land and the people of the land take a man from their territory and they make him their watchman. How many watchmen in the house? How many watchmen in the house? How many watchmen in the house? And I make him their watchman. When he sees the sword is coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes, takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not do anything, did not take the warning. His blood shall be on him. But if he who takes warning will redeem, save, and deliver his life. Verse 7. So you, son of man, so you, body of Christ, so you, believers, I have made you watchmen for the house of Israel, for all the nation, or for all the nation, or for over your home, or over your life. I have made you a watchman. God made you a watchman. You did not make you a watchman. Heaven made you a watchman. God put the trumpet sound down in your spirit. God put the word down inside you. And he says, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house. Therefore you shall, somebody say shall. You shall hear a word from my mouth. And with that word, you shall speak forth and you shall warn the people. What a tremendous responsibility for the prophet of God. What a tremendous responsibility for the body of Christ. See, as believers, the more we get focused on the message of God and the message of his kingdom, the more we see the victory of circumstances in our own lives. The more we get God's word and God's heart and recognize his kingdom on the inside of us, it's supposed to be his kingdom demonstrated outside of us. The kingdom that God put on the inside of us is a kingdom God wants to demonstrate outside of us. How many demonstrators do I have in the house tonight? You are called to demonstrate the kingdom. There is a voice that God has put down inside of you to address and confront. Doesn't matter the state of the world. Doesn't matter the state of a nation. Doesn't matter the state of a generation. God has a word to challenge it and confront it for the purpose. Bringing it back into his own, God declared divine order, and that word comes from you as a believer. Turn to Isaiah chapter 6. The strength of that message is connected to the strength or the power of the revelation that you as a believer have of the king and of his kingdom. The world wants to make Jesus into nothing more than maybe a, maybe a nice guy, a good teacher, maybe, maybe a little bit of a prophet, kind of a Monty Milktoe kind of a guy. They want to they they relegate the king to being nothing, but you and I know who he is. And in order to be effective, we have to get the revelation of just how mighty and how powerful he is. Isaiah, in chapter 6, is operating in this manner. He's a, he's a young man about to be called into the prophetic office. And like so many in the nation, 
He thought he was doing good. Even though the nation wasn't doing well, it had, had its backslidings and it had its problems. Yet, yet Isaiah, as a priest, probably thought, well, things were probably pretty well okay. And sometimes, outside of calamity, we tend to think that everything is good because we think it's good with us. This is based on a revelation of the king. And Isaiah thought it was bad, but it wasn't that bad. But listen, it's because of the standard of heaven that our message either has or has not an ounce of authority. Either it has all authority, or it has none authority. Notice what he says. Chapter 6, verse 1. In the, king, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah would begin a ministry that would last almost 60 years. It would be a radical ministry to consistently confront a nation. But the message in the ministry was connected to what Isaiah saw. And he says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, I saw him high, I saw him lifted up, and the train of his robe filled all the house. Isaiah had never seen this. Suddenly he gets a glimpse of the holiness of God. Suddenly the standard of heaven is suddenly revealed to him as everything parts before him, and he sees God in his glory, in his might, and in his splendor. And it says, and even above this, the seraphim of God, the ultimate, the ultimate holiness of creatures. The guardians of the very holiness and the revelation of the king, it says, and they were circling about him. And it tells you about the wings that they had, two, well, two, two covering their feet, two covering their face, with two they flew. Because his glory was so dynamic and so powerful that they could not look directly on God himself. It had to be filtered through the wings that they had to cover over their face. And they were created for the very matter in which they were doing. God's glory was so splendid and so mighty, and so powerful, that even the seraphims themselves had to actually cover their faces so the glory of God that came through would not even destroy them. And they were able to shout with what they could get through, holy, holy, holy. The failure that had been in the body of Christ is we lost sight of our king. We lost sight of his glory and of his splendor. We read the word to find out that, that our God is high and lifted up. That he is, he is like one whose hair is, is as white as wool and his, and his eyes are like flames of fire and his feet are like, why? Because we are serving a victorious, triumphant, mighty king. Our Jesus is a, somebody say king. He is a king. Say it again. 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 He is a king. God shows him as a king. And his kingdom is explosive. And Isaiah sees him and all of the glory and all of the seraphims and they are shouting holy, holy. So much that the sound of their voices shook the very earthly temple that Isaiah thought was everything. It's amazing how natural things are shaken by supernatural things. The things we think that we possess and we think they're good when it comes to the revelation of God, they have no power. Isaiah sits in this temple. The glory of God is revealed. His, his very anointing and his Shekinah is filling the house and the house itself is being shaken because anything that can be shaken will be shaken and all earthly things will eventually succumb to the kingdom of God. Listen, church, the more we get this revelation of a king that is coming, the greater and the stronger our message will be in the present. If we don't have that message, we don't have a message. If we don't have that revelation, we don't have a message. We cannot move hell. We cannot move devils. We cannot take a nation back. We cannot win a generation. We cannot see the lost come to the cross. You'll not see deliverance and breakthrough unless your message is so much greater than all the voices operating in the earth today. Our king is mighty and we must come back and see him as such. Isaiah was a good guy, but once he got one glimpse of glory, the Bible says, and here's how he responds. So I said, verse 5, woe is me, for I am undone. Somebody say undone. Yeah. Isaiah sees himself in the light of the glory of God, and he declares in himself, that's concerning myself and the entire nation, oh my gosh, I am undone. Everything in my mouth is vile. 
Nothing I've ever said is pure faith, pure glory, pure holy. Everything about me is unclean. And this is the priest of God. And not only am I unclean, but my gosh, I'm standing in the midst of a nation which is also unclean. This is, this is a sad state for Isaiah. He's like, my gosh, in the glimpse of heaven, church, we are calling men and women to the glory of God. Holiness must be the standard by which we operate. We have to see a nation and people's lives according to what the word declares. Otherwise, our message has no power. Otherwise, as watchmen, we will never blow the trumpet. Because when you see what's coming and the glory of what is coming and the reign of Christ which is coming, then your message becomes radical. It becomes bold. It becomes urgent. It's got to be a bold message. Your redemption is a bold declaration. Your witness and your testimony has a lot of power. And this nation today needs somebody who's got a revelation of God greater than the revelation of the fear and of the disease and all the things that are trying to take this nation captive. We got to have a revelation. They wanted to make you irrelevant. Well, God wants to make you so relevant that the world needs to take note that there is an anointing in the body of Christ, an anointing of such that the world cannot remove. we got to have a deciding decision. This is what we want. Isaiah sees this. And the Bible says he dwells in the midst of an unclean people. My eyes have seen the king. And verse 6 speaks about the greatness of redemption. And it says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. The altar which the fire of God had sparked, the altar that consumed the sacrifices, the altar that accepted the sacrifices, the altar that exposed the very standards of God because from the altar every offering was given. This was the fire of God that consumed and recognized the standard of every single offering. It was from this fire that God was able to declare what is good and what is not good, what is holy and what is profane. And if every sacrifice was complete because the fire was God's fire, fire that was taking place on the altar. God started that fire. And that fire was a purger and a cleaner and a consecrator. And here is Isaiah concerned about the standard of his being, seeing the glory of God in all of its splendor, recognizing the unholiness of himself and a nation. And you know what's exciting about God? When he shows you something, it's because he's got something to do. When God shows you something, he is showing you something because he's got something to do. And God has to show us as the body of Christ his holy standard so we can once again come to the platform and to the place where we recognize where sin has been ordering and controlling our lives. Bondages have been controlling our lives. Where the weakness in our flesh has been controlling our lives. It's time for the church to come back to a place of repentance so the church should come back to a place of effectiveness. Come on, somebody shout me down. Is that right? This is challenging the prophet of God so that he can. The angel of God brings this piece of coal from the, very, from the very heart of the fire and he brings it down and he touches the mouth of Isaiah. And why, and why his mouth and why not his heart or why not his foot? Because out of the heart the mouth speaks. By putting it on his tongue, he transformed everything about his speech. Everything, listen, your speech seasoned with the salt of the word of God should always declare that you are a child of God. Out of your mouth there is a declaration of what kind of worshiper, what kind of praiser, and what kind of Christian you truly are. Out of your mouth, remember, because your words speak louder than your actions. What comes out of your mouth tells people what's going on on the inside of you. Somebody say hallelujah. That's why we need God down on the inside. So the word of God comes to him and, and, and the word says that your iniquity is purged, your sin is removed, everything is taken away. You are now presentable for a purpose. This is a tremendous consecrating time in this nation. With everything that is happening and taking place. The church is the one place that's being challenged by God, the world, and even many leaders wanted to make us irrelevant. We had a fight to become relevant. I've said it before when this whole thing broke out. True godly leaders would have called up churches all over this nation 
and would have asked them to gather their congregations together and go to war in prayer, supplication, and intercession to drive this disease from our shores. They should have looked after the church. They should have wanted the church. They should have called the pastors. They should have wanted the leaders. They should have wanted the congregation. But if the church wasn't being the church, they didn't know what to call because there'd be no fire in the church. They would have nothing to address. But now we are coming back to the place and say, we got the fire. We got the anointing. We got the word. We got the power. God is moving in the house. This nation ain't over with. It's not done with. God is just getting started. Now we are rising up because we are going to be a banner and a covering for this nation until this nation becomes one nation under God. We must take our place and Isaiah is now purged and cleansed and the Lord says now who will go and take my message? Who will be the trumpet blast to this nation? Go to Jeremiah chapter 1. Understanding the scope of the call of God in your life. So I want to stir. The church must be stirred in this season. We must make decisions. God's healing, delivering power is always present to set you free. But you must become the vessel. Know that God calls you. That God appoints you. God is the one that anoints you. And he hands you the platform of the word that he wants to put in your spirit. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Well, your words have tremendous power. God is no respecter of persons. He wants to put a word down on the inside of you. Somebody say a word. God wants to put a word. He wants to put his kingdom right here. He wants to put such an anointing of fire. That was like shut up inside your bone. Fire no man can put out. One that's just bursting to come out. A hallelujah. A blessed God. A warning. A prophetic utterance. It does not matter. There is something, something that comes against every disease. Every, come on, last time you told the, last time you told cancer, loose your hold. Yeah. Jeremiah was a young man. He was a young prophet. He would be a young, one of the youngest prophets in the Bible. And God reached out to him in a season to bring about one last great revival. One last great move of God. And God reached out to this man. And all he wanted was somebody that was a servant. Somebody say servant. Say it again, servant. Can you imagine the church come together as a bunch of servants wanting to serve the Lord Jesus Christ? The kind of damage we could do to hell's kingdom. Understand, we are not called to survive you're not called to survive. Animals survive. You're called to overcome. You're called to be a demonstration of his kingdom. God didn't call you to survive. He calls you to win and bring others into the same victory. Somebody say, hallelujah. I've got purpose. Here's what he says. Jeremiah, he says, the word of the Lord came to me. Verse 5, before I formed you in the womb, before I even knit you together. Before I formed you in the womb, life is everything to God. Every child had purpose, has placing, has an agenda, has the prophetic of God. Everyone formed in the womb. God has had it laid out from the foundations of the world. And I'm so glad that they're still allowing children to be born in this nation, which means there are still prophetic voices being raised up by heaven. Before I knew you, I formed you. Before I formed you, I even knew you. Knew your purpose, your place, your calling, your election. There's no accidents when it comes to God's kingdom. Don't look at yourself and say, well, I can't because of who I am. God says, you know what? I, before I even fashioned you in the room, before I fashioned you in the womb, I dictated and I put within myself to put within you the very purpose of the election of my calling for your life. And as soon as you get connected to the Spirit of God, everything that God has laid out for you begins to come to pass, it begins to line up. The call and the election of God shows up the moment you make Jesus the Lord of your life. He has to call you into it. He laid it out before the foundations of the world. When you get born again, the Bible says you become the elect of God. Somebody say elect. Yeah. It means God doesn't save you and then have to figure out a place to put you. Yeah. Stand over there for a while because I don't have room. <laughs> too many, too many. Hold them back. Praise God for revival, but I have no agenda for that group. Just hang tight. I'll throw something at you. Yeah. Be blessed. 
There are no afterthoughts in God. You are not second best. None of us are perfect. Every single one of us stand in a place as just mere human beings with just flesh and bone. We are created out of the dust and the dirt of the earth. God breathed the breath of life into you and I. And just because of his love and because of his grace, he designed and destined to use your life and my life to advance his kingdom. God said, you are very good. You are very good. You are very good. He said, I fashioned you. Don't look down on yourself. That's sin. God says, I fashioned you. I chose to use you. I adopted you. I called you. I elected you. I saved you. I sanctified you. And I see you glorified with my son right in the kingdom. You are the desire of God's heart. Mm. <laughs> Whew. Suddenly I feel important. And he said, before I formed you, before you were born, I sanctified you. Huh. I ordained you. I established your future. And now I'm calling you to it. The nudge of the Holy Spirit for your life. The nudge of God on your life. Think about this. God was calling you when he nudged you, when you gave your life to Christ, when he nudged you, he was calling you into the purpose he had laid out from the foundation of the world. He was calling you into that purpose. Before I even formed you, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I already had ordained you. I had set you apart. Don't look at what you can and what you cannot do. I've already done it. I've already declared it. Now I'm just calling you to step on into it. Let God work out his plan. Mm. But he said, oh, God, I can't speak. Oh, I sure can. But anyways. No, you're not going there. I will have to pray for you. Oh, I'll pray for you some more. And he says, Lord, I don't have what it takes. See, God knows exactly the scope of the anointing and the message and the ministry. He wants to put on you the strength of the trumpet he wants to put on you because he's made you a watchman somewhere. Somewhere. And he said, here's what you're going to do. The Lord said, do you do not say I can't. Do not say I'm a youth because I'm going to send you to whomever I have chosen to send you. Don't tell me you can't. If I send you, I've already prepared something in you and on you. Listen, and whatever I command you, that is what you shall speak. You don't have to speak your own thing. Whatever I command you to speak. The Bible says the Spirit of God makes intercession. And the Bible also tells us the Holy Ghost shall reveal to you everything that belongs to Christ. Everything that is Jesus. And this is John's gospel that belongs to you. The Holy Ghost knows how to put that word right in you. Know what to say? Wait on the Holy Spirit. He got to tell you what. He's going to put inside of you. And like a trumpet blast, that thing's going to come out of you. You're going to, know, you're going to go, oh my gosh. And you're going to have to find out it was God all along. And he says, Whatever I say to you, what you'll speak. Do not be afraid. Let me see, do not be afraid. I want you to circle that in your Bible. Do not be afraid. The more we speak out in Christ, the more there'll be opposition about preaching the gospel. I'll say it very emphatically. There are those that try to bring in a global order in this world. They want to crush Christianity and faith and everything like it. And we could have done one or two things. We could have let them, or we could have rose up and said, not in this season, not in this time. Not over this generation. There are too many of us praying and believing that God will give us a stay of execution and drive that spirit back because God is not finished. Otherwise, we're wasting our time in church. Otherwise, we are wasting our life because if God is done with this nation, we might as well just pack our bags and head out over to Rapture Mountain and just hang out until we go. But I'm telling you, he is not done. He is not done. I don't think there is a rapture mountain, but if there was. Why would God do that? Mm, he ain't done this. Somebody say, somebody say he ain't done yet. He ain't done with me yet. Because I'll put a word in your mouth. I'll tell you what to say. Because God had another revival coming. 
Jeremiah saw the nation as failing into nothing. But God had another revival. There was a king, Josiah, that was about to come into being. And his kingdom would, be, would have one of the greatest revivals the nation ever saw. And Jeremiah would stand as a prophetic voice in the middle of that revival. So I don't ever say it's over with. It's only over with when we hear the trumpet blast from heaven and God calls us home. Then it's see you later, sayonara. You should have gotten born again. But as long as you've been a trumpet blast on your way up, you're ready and excited because you ran your race all the way to the day. God is not done with you. He's not done with the nation and he does not have his harvest out of this generation. And that's why he wants to put a trumpet inside your mouth and say, I will hold back hell. I will hold back the four winds until I get my harvest and you are the very vessels of that harvest. Come on, somebody get excited. Therefore he says, I have put my words in your mouth. I have put my words. See this day, verse 10, the realm of the authority that I have put within you. See, the word of God is everything to you. If you put your finger there, fling over to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I want you to understand something. Because the weapons of our warfare are what? They are not what? They are not carnal. But what are our weapons? They are mighty through God. 2 Corinthians, not 1 Corinthians, Pastor. Fine, second. Thank you very much. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And this is what Paul writes as he's about to dress all the rebellion in a particular local church. He's about to come at it with the anointing of God and the gifts and the callings and the election with the power of heaven. And he says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, of our, say our weapons, our weaponry. Come on, the gifts of God, the anointings of God, the revelations of God, everything that God has, these are weapons for the believer. God wants to show you what's coming. God wants to reveal to you what's coming. God wants to put it in your mouth, what he wants you to say. God wants to put an anointing on your life. Why? Because you are a warrior. See, I'm a warrior. You don't fight devils with sticks. You fight devils with the anointing of God. You fight devils with the word of the Lord. You fight devils with the unction. God put down it. Mm, God puts it down inside. And before you could swallow it back, it come up out of your mouth. And that devil went running. And you realize I should have tried to fight it. But that word came up inside of you. And that word went to war. Because the Holy Ghost wanted to set another warrior free. And raise up another one. Called from the foundation of the world. And he just used your trumpet mouth to say it. So it's amazing. Some mouths need to be changed. But your mouth can still be a trumpet for God. Weapons of your warfare are not kind of, but they are mighty through God. They have the power to pull down strongholds, cast down every argument, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bring every thought into captivity. Sometimes people think that the church is supposed to shut up. Well, obviously I can't. We're supposed to become politically correct. Politically correct. We're not supposed to wade into those waters. Said who? Said what devil that I cannot wade in and mess up his kingdom? You're not here for here. You're here to bring a harvest to there. This is not your home. Not your place of permanent residence. Since you've been born again, you are now on a sojourning journey and you are moving through and God wants you to grab every doggone soul you can on the way through and he wants to establish his kingdom all the way to the day. So when he calls us home, he's calling a mighty, redeemed church off the earth and hell will celebrate only then. Let's make his life miserable. Every weapon we got. So here's what he says. Go back to Jeremiah 1. He says, therefore I put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms. God gave him the realm of his authority. Say realm. The Spirit of God showed him. And we got to know as believers, what is that scope? Listen, we come together as believers, we cover everything. 
Because your realm and 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 your realm, and your realm they all run side by side. It's not just one soldier, but it's every soldier coming and running alongside each other with the giftings, the anointing that they possess and the realm of their effectiveness. You put the whole mess together and you have one powerful devil stomping army which has just been anointed because then they walk in a one accord move. Mm -mm. And he told Jeremiah, here's the, here's the authority of the word that you have. You're going to root out, pull down, destroy, overthrow, build and plant. You're going to mess some things up and you're going to restore some things. We've got to get us as believers to recognize things will never be the same since they were five, six months ago. Everything has changed. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is suddenly being called upon to become the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been comfortable, hoping for futures. Everything was going to be calm. Don't mess everything up. Have nice services. And then suddenly all hell broke loose. And the church has been called up to the fight. You have been recruited by heaven to step up into the fight. Somebody say, hallelujah. Go to the book of Acts chapter 5. I'm almost done here. Book of Acts chapter 5. Jeremiah had this call on him. He also had to know the positioning, what his anointing was, how far he could go. And God had told him, do not be afraid of what I bring you before. How many warriors in the house? Listen, church. Devils get in your face. You don't back down. The world don't like your message, you don't back down. Because the world may not like your message, but out of the world, out from the world, are those that desperately want the message. And the world, like devils itself, is trying to keep these people hidden. But God wants you to punch through to get out the harvest that he desperately wants. So he told Jeremiah, don't you ever be afraid of their faces. Don't you step back. You don't step back. We will keep moving forward. Somebody say, moving forward. Mm -mm -mm. Where did I make you go? The um, book of Acts. Thank you. <laughs> Just in case I get lost. Book of Acts, chapter 5. Hallelujah. Verse 23. Now, you got Isaiah with a revelation of the king and his splendor. Jeremiah discerning the call and the scope of his calling. Ezekiel understanding that he is called to be a trumpet voice into a nation with the Holy... Everything is coming together. So before I get to the last one, I want to show this one. And in, and in the book of Acts, chapter 5, in verse 23, the disciples... Listen, if, it, if, it, listen, if, they, if they endured it, you and I can endure it. They are an example for at times what real church is supposed to be. Can we really come together in the uncomfortable times? When your message is being hated and despised. And you'd be called a hater or anything else because you're a child of God. You and your single noted operation of salvation. You are not all inclusive. Therefore we, re therefore we relegate your speech as threatening. Hate speech. Well you know what? It is the most greatest speech of the radical love of God ever sent out of heaven. It is a powerful speech of deliverance and healing and forgiveness. If they got one glimpse of the God you and I serve the only glimpse they're going to get is you and I. The Bible says that they were abused because they've been preaching the gospel. People were getting saved, healed, and delivered everywhere. The church in Jerusalem was exploding so much that the religious leaders were beside themselves. They were actually standing beside themselves. But they were beside themselves with the understanding that this message is taking over and our authority is waning. And in order to win this, we must crush the message. So they dragged the messengers in before the Sanhedrin, huh? <laughs> and when they do, they thought to threaten their names, threaten them that you cannot preach the gospel. Somebody say, cannot. Let me ask you, can you preach the gospel? Do you have the right to preach the gospel? Where do you get your right to preach the gospel from? Right here. Right here. We have the duty 
and the call to share the gospel of God. But when there's another message out there, your message is in the way. When God wants to put a trumpet to your mouth. Well, these guys are threatened within the inch of their life, told that they do not obey, they're going to be beaten. They have to silence their voices, and they say, well, basically, who should we obey? You you or God? The test is, the breakthrough for a nation is when the church and the nation makes a decision that clothed in the love of Christ, we stand up united and in one accord and say, we will not be silenced. We are the answer to this nation. We are the direction for this nation. We are the redemption of this nation. We are the victory for this nation. We have the message for this nation. Therefore, we cannot sit down and we cannot be quiet because the God that called us is greater. Being let go, they came to their own companions, reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said. And when they heard that, they raised their voices to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God. Let me say hallelujah. hallelujah. Government is not God. God is God. And you're the one that made heaven and earth, the sea, all that's in it. You're the one who said, why do the nations rage and the people plot foolish, foolish things? Kings of the earth may come together and take their stand. They may even come together and the rulers may, may come together against the Lord and his anointed. They will do that. But, for truly they did this. Herod, Pontius Pilate, all the rest of them, they came together, but your hand purposed this. Now, verse 29, Lord, look on, your, look on their threats. Oh, sorry, chapter 4. It took you this long for someone to correct that. That's right, you all did very well. He's the man of God. He should know where he's at. Sorry, chapter 4. Do I have to start this all over again? No, no, no. We got it, Pastor. We're, we're good. It's all good. Knuckle bump. We got you. He figured it out. Heretic. Anyways. Huh. Now, Lord, look on their threats. And grant your servants that with all boldness, they may speak your word. Think about in reality. We don't want to go there, but we must. And let's just be real here. Church in Morris, Illinois. There are states that are trying to outlaw the preaching of this gospel. There is a state whose governor wants to fine every church $100,000 if they do not put an LGBTQ bathroom in their congregation. Now, isn't it amazing? These are the ones that scream separation of church and state, that you cannot do anything with the state, but yet they want to hone themselves right into your church and tell you what you have to and cannot do. That is unacceptable. It is right there. States are now being threatened to be thrown in jail. Oh, their, their church is closed down. Find huge amount in America. That is still happening. Listen, we're not hiding in this church. We are being as loud and noisy. Everything's being filmed and operated in. So much of it is live stream. Multiple of people across the nation tune into this ministry. We are trying to stir the body of Christ. We're not talking about anarchy. We're talking about someone needs to come together and go to war in prayer and intercession and break this doggone hold. A revelation of the trumpet sound of God has got to come in. This nation got to come back to God. We've got to declare that if God be for us, who can be against us? Greater is the anointing of God for the church. If the church will just grab it. We must open our eyes. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. So these guys say, Lord, look on their threats. Here's what you need, Lord. We need you to grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. Put an anointing of the word of God you put in us in such a way and demonstrate the very word that you put in us by stretching out your hands to heal and that signs and wonders and miracles 
will be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus Christ. I put a demand on us as the body of believers. Do we dare to ask God for an anointing of boldness? The Bible says that when they came back into that room, they came into a spirit of one accord. I've been saying this for a season. People are speaking gloom and doom to America. We have a lot of prophets out there saying it's all over with. Well, if they are, well, then why do we have millions of believers being led by the Holy Spirit to come to a place of repentance, consecration, and intercession for the deliverance of this nation? God is not schizophrenic. He wishes that none should perish. Remember, if my people who are called by my name, if they'll humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways and recognize that we've missed the mark. He says, I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin. And then what else will I do? I'll bring a stay of execution and a healing to this nation. I don't know what the ultimate future is for America. Actually, I do. Because the Bible says eventually all the nations shall be shall all be wrapped up and wiped away and only one kingdom is going to reign that will be the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ all the kingdoms shall come under his authority but until that day in every nation believers are called to be the watchmen on the wall because every nation will have to give an account to God everyone will answer to heaven and the church in every nation will give an account to God for that nation were you the warriors Did you blow the trumpet? Did you take your place? When God has to judge the nations, he's also going to have to judge the church in those nations. Where was the fight? Where was the fire? God used Jeremiah to stay in execution on that nation and bring a radical wave of revival that lasted for X amount of years. And that's where we stand. Stand your feet in the house tonight. What do we have? In Ezekiel, the Bible says in chapter 47 that the Bible says that the prophet saw the temple of God. Second Peter, you and I are called the temple of God. First Peter, we're called the temple of God. Say we're the temple of God. We are a whole new temple. Not the one built in Jerusalem, but we are the temple of God. Jesus is the cornerstone of a whole new house. And you're a part of that house. The temple of God. It's a living temple. Jesus Christ dwells in the midst of this temple. Coming together in one accord. We operate as part of the temple of the king in all of his splendor. And coming out of that temple. From the side where the, where the, where the, where the very ark of God was. Out from the threshold came a water. And the water turned and it went east right past the altar of offering and incense. It began to flow into another region. Out from the temple there came a flow of revival, awakening water. The angel of God took the prophet out about a third of a mile and the water was about ankle deep. Took the prophet out again another third of a mile and the water was now knee deep. He took the prophet out again another third of a mile and the water was now waist deep. Then he took the prophet of God out again another third of the mile and the water was over his head. A great river. When they came back to the sides of the river they saw that on both sides of the river were trees faces from his glory and from his splendor and from that place hear the voice of God say I have called you I have anointed you I have appointed you I'm going to put a word in your mouth and a flood of great revival down into your soul and I'm going to bring rivers of living water through you and I will touch the nations with it hallelujah come on give him praise Hallelujah. Come on, give him praise. Come on, give him praise. Today was a day of uh, used by all across this nation as a day of fasting and prayer. 
praying for this nation, the direction of this nation, the revival of this nation. And we joined in with that, but our prayer tonight was for you, the body of Christ. I just see the river. I see the water of God coming out of the temple right now. I see the water that God pours in coming through. That water that's connected to the very ark, the very covenant, our King, our Savior, our Lord, and the holiness of God all about it. And that river is beginning to come forth. There is a river of life. You are not called to be dead, but alive. And the church is the flow and the river and the anointing and the power of God. This is an awakening revival season. And I'm praying God sweep the church full of the rain and the glory river of God. Lift your hands up before the Lord in the house of the night. Father, I glorify you. Father, we exalt you tonight. We exalt you tonight. I want to open my doors and I want to give you a glimpse of my glory. I want to show you my might and my splendor. I want to show you of the wealth of myself. I want to reveal of who I am into your life. I so delight to show you. Jesus said, I desire that you come and be where I am and you see me in my glory. He delighted for them to see the splendor of their redemption. And I see God wanting to open the doors and give you a glimpse of that beauty and of that splendor. That which would draw you deep. Say, Lord, of your glory, wave it over your people. Let me pray for you tonight. It's all I can think to do tonight is I want to pray over you tonight. I want to speak God's kingdom over your life tonight. I want to speak as you to open your heart tonight and say, Lord, let me hear your heart. Let me hear the word of your kingdom. Show me your glory, Lord. Put your word down on the inside of me. Jesus, make me useful. You've called me from the foundations of the world, and I accept it. Somebody say, I accept it. I accept it. Show me what my place is in your river. Show me my place in your splendor. Show me my place. I'm a priest to God Almighty. For you are now a royal priesthood. You are a chosen generation. God has transformed you. He's brought you into the kingdom of his son. He has robed you in the righteousness of his glory. And he's put the stamp of his priesthood on you. And now you are a priesthood unto God. And you have every right as the priesthood to receive everything you need to be effective for your king. Give him a shout of praise. Give him